Chapter 4 Michael could feel reality intruding. His head was thumping. Less than woodpeckers. Perhaps little gnomes with clogs on, stomping and dancing around. They were having a party, and he certainly didn't feel very festive. He raised a hand to his head, feeling the bandage, and it all came flooding back. With a sigh, he lowered his hand. "'You missed your brother's visiting?' Kelly chirped. She wrapped a blood pressure cuff around his upper arm and proceeded to strangle it mercilessly. "'The three of you are quite handsome.' Michael opened his eyes to see her smile down at him. "'Ready for some pain meds?' He nodded gratefully, and the room spun. "'Dizzy?' He gave her a much shorter nod. "'The doctor said that could happen. Here, I'll lift the head of the bed, and then you can sit up a little better.' She stepped on a pedal, and the bed obeyed her command. He downed the pills that she gave him. Thankfully, his throat was feeling improved, so it only felt like he was swallowing gravel rather than cut glass. Now, I'm going to check with the nurses, but I think you have a scan coming up to see how the swelling of your brain is doing. The sooner the swelling goes down, the sooner we'll know how your pain is going to be. He had liked her before, but now she was far too cheery. She really needed to tone it down. What had she said about the pain? He tried to focus. Ah, yes. One of the side effects of the surgery is that the doctors couldn't promise that the pain would go entirely away. Even now, it was better than it had been for the past few months, so Michael supposed it was an improvement. At least he hadn't seen any black things floating around lately. He wondered where Anne was. He wondered what Noah and Max had thought about the ghastly turban on his head. It felt huge. He poked at it a moment, then decided he didn't want to accidentally remove it and find out if his brains were leaking out. He sat on his hands to prevent them from exploring on their own. A few minutes later, Kelly was back and took him in his bed to push around the corridors once more. This time, he closed his eyes and tried to breathe evenly. The dizziness hit him, and of course, he couldn't manage to say a word about it. It was like a bad carnival ride. The good news was that he didn't disgrace himself by puking or retching, really, since his stomach was empty other than pills and water. He endured scans of his head, a machine clicking and whirring around him. Eventually he got a repeat ride back to the private room that was his for the duration of his stay. He desperately hoped the dizziness would go away. He was not going to be confined to a bed or chair for the rest of his life. Vertigo was not going to become his constant friend, he vowed. Dr. Hemond came in smiling. He pulled up the chair and sat down. "'Good news, Mr. Ramsley. The lab results have come back for the tumors. Both were non-cancerous. This means that you will not require any chemotherapy or radiation. We'll have to schedule regular scans to make sure that no cells were forgotten or that new ones decide to grow again, but I feel confident that this will not be the case.' Michael felt relieved. He had no desire to be a cancer patient or to go through surgery ever again. I've checked today's scans, and the swelling is going down very well. How is your pain today when you woke up before medications? Dr. Hemon began counting, and Michael nodded at six. Better than yesterday. Good, good. Hemon made a note on his sheet. I think things are going very well. There's no sign of infection. Everything is going the best it possibly can. Part of Michael wanted to protest that. Losing the ability to effectively communicate was not the best that things could be. However, he was sure there could be worse alternatives. He could be dead. We'll keep you here and see how the skull fuses. In the meanwhile, has the dizziness decreased? Michael indicated that it hadn't really changed using a grimace and hand gesture. Let me know if it gets worse. Hopefully, as the swelling decreases, the dizziness will disappear as well. Dr. Hemon put his pen back in his lab coat pocket. Do you have any questions? Michael shook his head no. It wasn't like he could articulate even if he had any. Mostly, he just wanted to know when he could go home. Not to the downtown condo, but to the beach house. That's where he wanted to be right now. Sitting on the deck and listening to the waves. Dr. Hemon took his leave, and Michael stared at the ceiling. Besides sleep, he wondered what he was going to do in the hospital if no one was around. Michael had never really been bored before, and it wasn't the most pleasant sensation. What was he going to do with the rest of his life? There were no more 12- to 18-hour days at the office, no more presentations or meetings. It was kind of a relief, but also concerning. He really didn't know what was going to take up his time now. He'd have to take up some sort of work or hobby. 
Anne came in, and she looked entirely worn out. She had never been so beautiful to him. She plopped into the chair beside the bed and watched him. He watched her in return. He wanted to tell her what Dr. Hemond had said. He wanted to ask how Max and Noah had taken the sight of him, if they had made jokes about the turban bandage. He really wanted to know if he could change into sweats he had brought along instead of being this silly hospital gown. He wanted to urge her to get some sleep, but he knew that she was stubborn. For some reason she had appointed herself his guardian, and he was not about to complain even if he could. Having an idea, he moved over on the bed, then pointed to her and patted the space beside him. What? She shook her head. Anne had nearly been dozing upright. He motioned for her to come, and she went to the bed. Gently he took her hand and belt loop, urging her to sit, then lay down beside him. I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to share the bed with you. He put a finger to her lips, then wrapped an arm around her. Anne closed her eyes and snuggled up to him. If they come in, tell them I'm just listening to your heartbeat to make sure you're alive. She was rewarded with a small puff of amusement from Michael. They both knew he wasn't going to say anything. He rubbed her back, and in moments Anne was breathing deeply, lost in sleep. He must have drifted off himself, because the next thing he knew, Kelly was holding Evan, and Elle had Ethan, and they were making their way into the room quietly. I brought Anne a few things. Elle set down the bag on the chair. She came over to the bed. I don't think Noah did justice in describing the diaper on your head. Against his better judgment, Michael smiled. Noah couldn't have chosen a better woman to alleviate his seriousness. "'Seriously, you're rocking the headgear.' She hefted Ethan to a better position on her hip. "'I like your nurse. She complimented my baby, so that pretty much made her my friend.' Kelly grinned. "'They're cute. I think they're going to look as good as the other Mr. Ramsleys when they get older. I bet they'll be a duo of trouble when they hit the teenage years and discover girls.' L groaned. "'I'm not ready for the toddler years that are already here. Don't talk, teenagers.' "'Happens before you know it.' Kelly tapped Evan under the chin. L turned serious. How are you? Michael shrugged, using his free shoulder. Yeah, I feel that way some days, too. I suppose you can get away with it since you have a hole in your head. She motioned to Anne. How long has she been asleep? Michael looked at the clock on the wall. He held up two fingers. A couple of minutes, twenty, two hours. L stopped as he nodded. Noah said she was pretty wiped. Nice of you to share with her. Again, he shrugged. Not much of a conversationalist right now, are you? Michael gave her a look of caution. He wasn't ready for this conversation. However, L, being who she was, plunged ahead. I think there are two ways of looking at it, L said. One, you got a crappy deal. It sucks. But you're alive. Or we can go with scenario two, which is that I love the sound of my own voice. So you taking up less word time is great. Plus, I'm a pro at 20 questions, and now you and I are going to be playing a perpetual game. He raised an eyebrow, amused at her. Okay, so I'm not great at 20 questions. It'll make it even more fun, trust me. You'll be trying to communicate that you want me to run to the store to get beer or something, and I'll be yelling, Price is right, or it's a movie. He chuckled. He conceded that she was probably right. L sat down. I've decided that we are commandeering your beach house for Thanksgiving. Don't argue with me. There are enough of us with Paget joining the family and the twins. You can't say that you need to work, so all of us can be there. I am going to make a big dinner and stuff you men so full of gravy and turkey, you'll need to wear drawstring pants to watch the game. You still have that widescreen television there, right? He nodded. He'd actually upgraded it to even larger and high definition. He had no idea why, because he rarely ever watched television. Good. It's settled, then. How is the headache, Mr. Ramsley? Kelly asked. Michael paused and considered it. He was pleasantly surprised to feel that the gnomes had retired their wooden clogs and were just dancing around in sock feet. This was very pleasing, especially since he hadn't taken any medications in the last while. He held up four fingers. Evan and I are going to visit the nurse's station and get you a couple of painkillers. She clucked to the twin she held and danced him out the door. Really, I do like her, Elle said. I'm glad she's your nurse. I feel like she'll make sure you get the best care. Michael nodded. You know, you've taken the strong, silent type to a whole new level. He rolled his eyes. Elle giggled. 
I think you're going to be just fine. Her comment sobered him. It was never going to be fine. Not really. But she appreciated her faith in him. Hey, she reached out and took his hand. All of us are here for you, whatever you need. He nodded again and gave her hand a squeeze. At this rate, he was going to need a chiropractor for all the nodding and shaking his head and know that he was doing. Perhaps he could cock his head to the side once in a while, to even things out. Mine, Evan said loudly, and Kelly held the pills away from at arm's length. I know they look like candy, but trust me, you don't want them, Kelly laughed. She passed the squirmy boy to L. Mr. Ramsley, here is your medication. Hopefully we can get that headache down to a one or none. L stirred, and they all froze. She stretched, and reality intruded, telling her that she wasn't alone in the bed. She opened her eyes, blushing when she saw Michael. "'Good morning, sleepyhead,' Elle said brightly. Anne sat up, her blush deepening when she saw Elle and Kelly. She pushed her hair back behind her ears and tried to straighten her wrinkled blouse. "'I brought you a bag. The key is in the side pocket.' Elle hefted the bag a moment. I packed a few extra items, just in case. "'Thanks, Elle.' "'Why don't you go freshen up?' Kelly said kindly. "'Mr. Ramsley, if you just take those pills, I can get myself back to work before my boss finds me loafing in here.' Michael nodded and swallowed the pills obediently. An embarrassed Anne grabbed the bag and went to the washroom. Within ten minutes she felt like a new woman. The nap had been good. New clothes, makeup, and brush were far better. Back to feeling composed, she went out to the room and was disappointed that Elle had left with the boys. Kelly was gone as well. Michael gestured for her to join him again. Anne hesitated. You can't be very comfortable with me hogging half the bed. He held out his hand patiently. She sat down on the chair. Michael tried to say something, but it was like the word had fled his mind. He swallowed the frustration and put out his hand again, his eyes pleading with her. Anne thought about refusing him, but truthfully she didn't want to. She took his hand and then tucked herself beside him again. Perhaps she imagined it, but she thought he kissed the top of her head before settling himself. She hoped that he had. Michael, I know it's going to be a little while before you get released from the hospital, but what are you going to do when you go home? Someone is going to have to take care of all your appointments, look after your finances, run errands, and drive you wherever you need to go. He would no longer be able to use the company driver since he hadn't resigned. He supposed he could hire a company or a cab when he needed one yet it wasn't like he could just call and ask. He couldn't give directions or addresses. Michael frowned. He wasn't allowed to drive until cleared by the doctor. She was right about appointments as well. It wasn't like he could write them on the calendar. He gave a troubled sigh. Anne continued, I know that Noah and Max will help out as much as they can. However, I was thinking that it might be best if I help for a while. I've been organizing your life for years, and I suppose I could do it for a few more weeks until you find a better solution. She was willing to stay, at least for a while. Michael had never felt so relieved. If that's okay with you, Anne lifted her head to look at him. Michael nodded. He was not going to turn this opportunity down. Then that's settled. Anne laid her head back down and listened to his steady breathing. The next morning was not a good one. Watch out, he's a puker, Kelly warned the physical therapist as she held onto one side of the belt they had strapped around his waist. Michael gave her an unamused look. He was not happy with the situation. Finally, he had showered and been allowed to switch to the much more comfortable sweat clothes he'd brought from home. However, in the process, it had meant standing, walking, sitting, bending, and being upright. That wasn't so bad once the dizziness passed, but the first few minutes had been horrible, and, yes, breakfast had ended up making a reappearance, something which Michael was not proud of. Since then, his stomach was still a little nauseous, but there was no danger of a repeat performance. Anne had been dismissed and told to go away for an hour or so, and now the two diminutive women had hold of this belt strapped at his waist, and he was meant to walk the halls with the aid of a walker. He felt ridiculous. It was just a walk. Instead, they had turned it into a circus. He ignored Kelly and the other woman's chatter about the handsome, in their opinion, construction guys working on the wing downstairs. 
They prattled on about all sorts of things, and since he was never going to repeat the hospital gossip, they asked if he would mind if they decided to chat it up about the new romance that seemed to be happening between one of the new interns and a nurse. He neither gave nor denied permission, and so he learned, much against his will, that it was suspected the nurse was cheating on the intern with her ex. The evidence was flimsy at best. Michael kept walking, pushing the walker, because they insisted he have it, rather than that he needed it. Oh, there was a baby born yesterday. Had a full head of hair. We should go down to maternity and have a look at all the babies, Kelly said, her voice getting that gooey quality that many women get when they started talking about babies. Anne wanted babies. He still didn't understand what she had meant when she had asked if he could give them to her. Michael frowned, shoving the thought out of his head, and kept walking. They ended up at the glass window overlooking the babies, and the two women cooed at the collection of wailing and sleeping children. As he looked in, he saw what he supposed were some nice-looking ones and some downright ugly ones. He had no experience with babies other than when Noah and Max were children. He'd been ten when Noah was born, twelve when Max was born. Mostly, the nanny had cared for them. He had done things with them, like telling them stories, camping on the beach, teaching them to swim, taking them out in the old rowboat. He tried to teach them to sail, but Noah got seasick and Max was far too daring. He'd worried Max was going to kill himself and sink the boat before he finally mastered the skill. Sailing had been abandoned. Someday he might try to teach the twins. Kelly tugged on him and they trudged down the hall. He learned where the gift shop was was paraded through all sorts of halls, stopping at all sorts of nurses' stations, getting introduced around as the girls caught up on any rumors. He started to get the feeling that this was more about them playing hooky rather than his well-being. Finally, he began to recognize that they were headed back to the hall that led to his room. He was starting to get tired, but he still refused to lean on the walker. It was a point of pride. Then he saw Max in the hall ahead. Fortunately, he was headed toward the room, which meant they were following him. It was unlikely that he would spot Michael, which suited Michael just fine. It was bad enough that he had this, how had L put it, this diaper on his head. He really didn't need Max to see him with a walker. There was only so much humiliation a man could take in one day, especially since he puked in front of Anne. He pushed the memory away. "'Hey, there's Mr. Ramsley's brother Max!' Kelly exclaimed. She raised a hand to get Max's attention. Hi, Max! Since when was Max allowed to be called Max, and he was still called Mr. Ramsley rather than Michael? Michael scowled at Kelly. He's a hottie, the physical therapist said to Kelly, looking Max up and down. I know, right? Kelly said right back. She bounced on her feet and smiled. He's coming over. You're so lucky you've got such a great family, Mr. Ramsley. Lucky, right. He sighed and watched Max approach. Max was grinning and gestured to the walker, taking the new wheels out for a spin. Michael ignored the remark, but the physical therapist tittered like it was the most amusing thing she had ever heard. Don't worry about cranky pants. He's just in a mood, Kelly said. Michael stared at her in shocked surprise. Cranky pants! Max howled with laughter. He laughed long and hard, leaning against the wall. I am so going to use that. He was done. He didn't need the walker. He didn't need these two nurses following him around. He disentangled the belt from his person and handed it to the physical therapist. He left the walker and trailed one hand on the railing as he went back to his room. He might not be able to read the room numbers, however, he knew it was the third one on the right from the nurse's station. He had no idea what he was going to do when he got to the room, but that was where he was going. Mr. Ramsley, you can't just walk away, Kelly said as he chased him with the walker. I think you hurt his feelings, Max was still chuckling. Come back, cranky pants. He walked straight and with pride. He had been the head of a multi-billion dollar company. Cranky pants. I'm sorry, I apologize. I was entirely unprofessional saying that. It slipped out. Sometimes I call my son that when he's having a bad day. He ignored her and counted doors in his head. Please don't let my boss know. I need this job. I love my job, and normally I'm very good at it. Kelly had to lengthen her stride to keep up. I have a son which I need to provide for. 
I know that's low to bring him into this, but I really need this job. Michael stopped in his doorway. He sighed. He was sighing a lot these days. He looked down at Kelly. I am so sorry, she apologized again. It will never happen again. He nodded. It wasn't like he could complain to anyone anyways. Perhaps he had been a little moody today. Then again, it hadn't been the best morning. Thank you. I promise you're released from the Belton Walker, she said excitedly and hurried the offending piece of equipment back to the physical therapist. Feeling better after that little temper tantrum? Max asked, amused. Michael gave him a look, his expression telling Max not to start anything. He turned and went into the room, sitting down on the edge of the bed. You're looking a lot better than yesterday, Max remarked, still smiling. He took the chair and put his feet up on the bed beside Michael. He looked entirely relaxed. Michael looked at the feet pointedly, but Max didn't move them. I talked to the nurses at the station. They said you have an appointment with a speech therapist today, plus more head scans. Max folded his hands on his stomach, slouching comfortably. I heard you refused the pain pills this morning. His pain had been a two out of ten. It was manageable. He didn't feel the need to swallow pills for it. As for speech therapy, he didn't even want to think about that waste of time. Hey, Max dropped his feet and sat up, suddenly serious. I get that you don't want to be here. No one likes to be sick in the hospital, least of all one of us. I would hate to be in your shoes. But you could cut the nurses some slack. They are trying to help you. Michael sighed and gave a half nod. Good. Max grabbed the remote to the television. Michael wanted to say that he hadn't bothered to have it hooked up. Here's the game. Baseball. The Yankees were playing Boston. Max must have paid to connect the television service up or added it to Michael's hospital bill. Max had gotten comfortable in the chair again, feet up on the bed. Michael didn't even push them off. He simply leaned back in the bed to watch the game. Anne had gone home and taken a long shower. She'd switched out some items in her bag and canceled a couple of appointments that she had. They could wait. She'd even managed an hour nap before heading back to the hospital. On the way, she bought a day planner so she could start managing Michael's personal life with it. She would keep track of all of his appointments and medications with it. This morning had been a disaster. She felt like Kelly was rushing Michael. Getting out of bed to shower and dress when it was obvious that he got dizzy had been a bad idea, especially right after breakfast. Fortunately, she hadn't gotten any of the vomit on her. Poor Michael had worn most of it. He'd look so pale, in pain, and completely mortified. Kelly had simply and cheerfully called in reinforcements to get him into the shower. They had told Anne to go away for a while. Michael was scheduled to go walking, so there was no point in her waiting and staring at the walls. Anne had protested their plans. Michael did not seem in good enough shape to do what they were asking of him. Kelly had firmly and merrily pushed her out of the room. Anne hoped that they knew what they were doing. Now she was returning, fully expecting Michael to be spent. Instead, she could hear Max arguing. She picked up her pace. He was out. No question about it, Max exclaimed loudly. Anne slowed her pace and looked in the room. Michael was giving Max a look that said he was crazy and made the universal safe sign. You need glasses. So does the ump. Max slouched back, his feet on the bed where Michael was comfortably reclined, one leg bent as they both stared at the television. See, right there, the ball beats the runner. Michael snorted and pointed to the television. Well, from that angle, sure. But from the first angle they showed, he was totally out, Max insisted. He winked at Anne, then turned his attention back to the television. Both of them suddenly groaned at one of the plays that were made. Anne leaned in the doorway. She'd been so worried, and here he was, enjoying himself with Max. Max had a real way of connecting with people and bringing them out of their shell. She'd missed him over the past few years and was glad that Michael and Max appeared to have repaired the rift in their relationship. Michael saw her and smiled. She walked over to the bed and he made room for her. There was nowhere else for her to sit unless she sat on Max, so she decided to share the bed. It wasn't like a million people hadn't already seen her snuggled up to him sleeping. 
Max raised an eyebrow, but she ignored him. What's the score? Boston is spanking the Yankees. Michael keeps telling me they'll catch up. I think it's a done game. Bottom of the seventh. Michael shrugged. He mimed a walking figure with his hand. No way. Strike out. What? Anne looked at Max. We're predicting what's going to happen with the new batter. Michael says he's going to walk. Anne watched the pitch fly in. It was a ball. The pitcher's going to bean him. Both men looked at her, so she asked, Why not? Unlikely, Max said. It could happen, she insisted. If I were pitching, I'd bean him before I walked him. Well, oh, then it's a good thing you don't pitch. I used to. Michael knew she'd pitched for a competitive high school team. His private investigator had turned up the information because, yes, he'd yielded to the temptation of spying on her. She'd gotten a college scholarship to pitch. She'd turned it down to come work for him, and he had no idea why. Now he'd never get to ask her. You what? Max asked absently. The pitch was made, and sure enough, even though the batter jerked to try to get away, it hit him off the ankle. He danced around in pain. I pitched, Anne said in satisfaction. Michael made a motion with his arm. He already knew the answer, but put in the question like he didn't. No, not windmill. Regular pitching. I was supposed to go to college pitching. They thought I might make it to the ladies' state team and even go national. Why didn't you? Max asked, suddenly interested. I didn't want to. I love to play the game, but to make it into a job? No, thank you. She smiled, remembering. I did recreational for a while, but got so busy with work I just gave it up. Michael thought that was a little sad. She'd given up a sport that she loved. Mr. Ramsley, it's time for your speech therapy appointment. Michael grimaced, but got up to dutifully go with the nurse. Anne immediately grabbed his arm. Are you going to be okay? He nodded, gave in her hand a squeeze, and then followed the nurse. Anne, I know you want to protect him after all he's been through. We all do. But we need to let him decide what he can and can't do, Max admonished softly. She didn't see what he went through this morning, she said. No, but I did find him capable of what he was up against this afternoon, Max chuckled. One of the nurses called him cranky pants. What? Anne was angry. Who? He deserved it, Max said. Plus, it motivated him. I wouldn't get upset over it. The whole episode was good for him. He needs to do things for himself rather than being pandered to. Anne fell silent. Max was right. Eventually, they were going to have to let Michael do things on his own. Maybe not everything, though. You're right, I suppose. I'm always right, Max said confidently, except when I'm wrong. Anne smiled. Tell me about this girl you're engaged to. My favorite subject, he smiled happily. Her name is Paget, and she's the most talented, kind, amazing woman who, for some strange reason, likes me. Anne watched Max get animated as he described the woman he loved. That was what she wanted. Someone who would be happier for just having her, for loving her. Her heart ached with a bit of envy. Michael did not envy the speech therapist his job. Ted shoved his glasses high up his pudgy nose again and showed off the cartoonish picture cards proudly. He explained that while Michael would never be able to use the word cards, there was no reason he couldn't learn to communicate with the picture cards. For instance, if you wanted an apple, you might grab that card that has fruit and show it to the person behind the counter at the cafeteria. Ted held up the card for emphasis. Michael wondered if he had ever worked with adults before. Then the clerk might ask what type of fruit you wanted. You could point and nod until you got the apple. Maybe he only worked with mentally challenged or brain-damaged adults. Brain-damaged like him. Michael resolutely pushed the thought away. Or you might want to take a walk. Then you could hold up the walking guy here. Ted tapped the card. Carding around a deck of picture cards just in case someone asked him a question. Michael sighed. Was there a card for not happy and would rather be doing something else? This card is if you'd like to phone someone. See, it has a phone on it. Pretty self-explanatory. This is a picture of a toilet, so that you can ask where the bathroom is during a trip. 
No, absolutely not. He was not going to be some 50-year-old man holding up a picture of a toilet to some stranger. They'd think he was a pervert or something. Here's a music note so you can ask someone to sing or turn on the radio. Ted pushed up the glasses again. This one has a giraffe, elephant, and ape on it. You might want to ask someone if they would like to go to the zoo. Go to the zoo? Really? Michael ran a hand across the stubble on his chin. Maybe Ted had brain damage. That was uncharitable. He really shouldn't think like that. The poor guy was just trying to do his job. Here we have a picture of an Xbox if you want to ask someone to play a game. Michael looked up and prayed for patience. The way he figured it, he really just needed one card. It should simply say, Hi, my name is Michael. I have speech aphasia. That means I can't talk, but I understand everything you say. That was the card he needed. Maybe it should have a phone number on the other side, like a lost dog tag. Please call so-and-so if you find me. This is a television. He could see that. He wasn't blind. Hmm. Pardon me? Ted squinted at him. Michael shook his head and tapped the next card. Best to get this over with. Oh, that's if you'd like to go to the park. This was geared for children. Great. He picked up some cards and sorted through them. Nothing for the beach. He wondered how he was going to tell Anne that he wanted to go back to the beach house. Perhaps he could just tote around an erase board and a dry erase marker. He was credible at sketching. Ted went through the rest of the cards with him. He gathered them up and handed them to Michael. This is your very own deck. Wonderful. His very own deck. Michael slowly took them. He offered his hand to Ted, who, surprised, shook it. Do you need help to go back to your room? He shook his head negative. He managed just fine, his sense of direction not letting him down. However, the nurses at the station waylaid him, sending him for another round of head scans. Michael patiently put up with the prodding. Finally, they changed his bandage, Dr. Hemond overseeing. Everything was pronounced good, and he received a smaller bandage. The diaper was gone. He was released once more, but instead of heading back to his room, Michael found a mirror in the men's room. The bandage was a lot smaller, but still stood out, pronouncing him damaged. He didn't like it. He wasn't a vain man, but he'd like to be tidy, put together. He sighed, resigned. At some point, it would go away. So would the stitches. His hair would grow back and cover the scar. In the meanwhile, he'd just have to live with it. Michael made his way back to his room. Anne was still there, jotting down something in a day planner. Max had left. He tossed the cards onto the side table. One of them caught his eye, and suddenly a solution presented itself to him. He looked at the clock on the wall. He had maybe a half hour. The Yankees lost by three. At least they caught up in the end, Anne said. They changed your bandage. It's smaller. That's good. Michael nodded absently, opening the cupboard and rifling through his overnight bag for his wallet. There was his credit card. Perfect. He palmed it and walked out. Michael? Anne's voice floated after him. He went to the gift shop and looked around. There. Perfect. The clerk rang it up for him without an issue. See, he didn't need those cards. He smiled, ripping off the price tag. He put the gray knit hat on his head. It covered the bandage easily. It was comfortable. It fit with his sweats. For a moment, he felt normal. No one was looking at him and wondering about his head like he was some sort of freak. It was a good feeling. He returned to his room where Anne was waiting. When she spotted the hat, it was obvious that she didn't know what to say. He sat on the bed and patiently waited. He knew that she would figure out the why. Anne knew him better than anyone. She came to stand before him and gently adjusted the hat. Got tired of everyone looking at your head? He nodded. With the beard stubble, it's a very good look on you. Very Gary V. She trailed her hand over his cheek as she sighted the famous entrepreneur. He rolled his eyes. Well, you are handsomer. Plus, your voice is much nicer than his. Suddenly, he felt a little hollow. Anne immediately realized her mistake. I'm sorry, Michael. I didn't mean... He placed a finger on her lips, then gave her a hug. He'd forgive her anything. He slowly released her, and she tilted her head. It is different. I've never seen you wear anything remotely like that hat, but I do like it. He smiled. Did the doctor tell you it wasn't cancer? 
she asked. He nodded. She sat beside him and took his hand. I am so thankful. You've been through enough. He squeezed his hand. He was thankful, too. He was also thankful that she had been there beside him through this whole thing. I have a confession, she said. He looked at her curiously. I looked at the cards they gave you. He rolled his eyes. I think we can probably get rid of half of them. Maybe a few more. Anne looked a little mischievous. Unless you'd like to go to the zoo sometime. Against his will, Michael gave a smile and shook his head. He had no need to visit the zoo. Anne and he sorted through the cards, good-naturedly arguing over a couple of them. She put the toilet in the keep pile. He would sneak it out later and throw it away. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Words Unspoken. Also, please share this video for others to find it. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.